Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to talk about the Godhead, specifically the Binitarian view of the Godhead. Binitarian view? What's that? Uh, is God a trinity? Is that what most people who profess Christ used to believe? What's the Godhead actually composed of? We, continue, we in the Continuing Church of God believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But as the Bible, not any traditions of men or councils of men, uh, define them. Now, I mentioned the term Binitarian, and I'd like to read a, a definition from a non-Church of God scholar by the name of Michael Barnes, who explains the Binitarian view in this particular way. Quote, The word Binitarian is typically used by scholars and theologians as a contrast to Trinitarian theology. So I just want to stop there. Many people in the Church of God haven't even heard the term uh, Binitarian. But they don't realize that that's the view of the Godhead uh, that pretty much all, all hold within the Church of God. It's just it's a term they're not used to. So anyway, uh, Michael Barnes continues. A theology of two in God rather than a theology of three. It's accurate to offer the judgment that most commonly when someone speaks of a Christian Binitarian theology, the two in God are the Father and the Son. A substantial amount of recent scholarship has been devoted to exploring the implications of the fact that Jesus was worshipped by those first Jewish Christians, since in Judaism, worship was limited to the worship of God. So, in other words, the reality is many scholars have been looking into this subject and realized that Jesus was worshipped from the beginning, from Christians with a Jewish background, and hence, it's like, okay, obviously, early Christians believed the Father was God, and they believed that the Son was God. Now, some of the recent scholarship that Michael Barnes refers to has been the result of the translation of a document called the Nag Hammadi and other ancient manuscripts, uh, which were not available uh, uh, for a while in, in English. When older scholarly texts, such as uh, William Bossett's Curios Christos, 1913, uh, came out, which uh, seemed to have a different conclusion. Now, I'm going to use the Bible a lot, but I'm also going to talk about historical and other sources for a couple of different reasons. But first, let's use the Bible. Take your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, uh, to Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Now, most of the time, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version of, of the Bible. It says here in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, people see that. Okay, well, we know that. Well, the Hebrew word translated as God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim. And let me read a definition of it. Elohim. Plural of Old Testament word 433. So it's a plural term. God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used in the plural thus of the supreme God occasionally applied by the way of deference to magistrates and sometimes a superlative. So, why am I bringing that out? Because the first time the term uh, God is used in the Bible, it's a plural term. Now, continuing in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So Genesis 126 is talking about this, this Elohim is us. It's a plural. Us is a plural word. So there's no doubt from the beginning the plurality of God was known. There are some arguments that Unitarians bring up. They don't like this. They say there's no doubt that the Elohim are a plural structure and there are messengers in the Bible referred to as angels. And Christ himself was an angel of the presence of the angel of Yahweh. So it's absurd to suggest that no angel referred to as a creator when Christ was admitted to be the creator. He was also the angel of Yahweh. And he says there's no indication that plural terms involving creators were confined to two uh, beast with beings, which were God and Christ. This is unsupported. And it says it's moreover a basic assertion of Binitarianism, which is logically absurd and conveys with it structure the logical inevitability of Trinitarianism. 
Now this is ridiculous. Uh, he's saying, this is a, an article by somebody, I won't mention his name because he gets mad when his name is brought up. But he's saying that Vinitarianism leads to Trinitarianism, which is not true. Um, it's like, like saying uh, drinking, uh, e eating food leads to gluttony. You have to eat food, but you don't have to become gluttonous. Well, if, if God is, uh, if the Binitarian nature of God is true, which it is, that doesn't mean you have to accept uh, Trinitarian or some other uh, non-biblical stars. And we'll get to some Trinitarian parts in, in just a moment. Now, Colossians uh, uh, 1, 15 to 17, makes clear that God created all things through Jesus. Hence, the idea of God and Christ as the only two beings involved in creation is not a recent concept, uh, as they are mentioned in Scripture. Now, let's go to Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 through 4 for just a moment. I'd like to read something here. Anyway, this uh, Unitarian argument, our person said, this I, uh, error of Unitarianism entered the church 30 to 40 years ago, and some people cannot divest themselves of that paradigm. So he's claiming that's a relatively new invention, uh, Unitarianism. Well, I'm going to go through scriptures to show that it's not. I'm going to go through some lessons of history that shows that it's not as well. I mean, Hebrews 1, verse 1. It says, God, who at, at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days, in these last days, spoke to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Verse 4, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So Jesus, while he was a messenger of the Father, is not was not what was commonly called an angel. So, anyway, one concern that people have uh, who support Unitarianism is it says the Bible says God is one, and you, therefore God cannot have uh, two. There could be two. Not, there could not be two or more beings in the Godhead. But this is based on a misunderstanding of the word one. You say, how can you just understand one? There's one. Okay. Well, if you look at what the Bible teaches and explains, it becomes clearer and clearer what type of one we're talking about. Uh, for example, you could have one church. Well, the one church is made up of many people. Uh, most of the time you have a church that's going to have multiple people in it. Uh, one nation. One nation will consist of its residents and citizens, how many people that may be. You say, well, that seems to be a stretch. No, not actually. Go to the book of Genesis, since you're in there, and go to chapter 2, verse 24. We're going to read something in Genesis 2, 24. It says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they sh shall become one flesh. So we've got two people becoming one. And that's from, that's from the Old Testament. As far as uh, some duality to do with the Godhead, you don't have to go there. Uh, at Psalm 110, verse 1, David wrote, The Eternal said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Jesus commented about this in Matthew uh, 22, 45. And he says, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Jesus was showing that he was Lord, and thus that there were, there were two. Now, in the book of Daniel, and I'm going to spend more on the Old, New Testament in a moment, but as far as the Old Testament goes, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, I'd like to read a vision that Daniel had. Uh, Daniel 7, uh, starting in verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds in heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an ever everlasting dominion, 
which shall not pass away, and his kingdom will be one which shall not be destroyed. So there were two. There was the Ancient of Days, who in the New Testament is called the Father, Matthew 6, 9, for example, and one like the Son of Man, which is a term Jesus used to refer to himself frequently, uh, the Son of Man, uh, Matthew 20, verse 18, for example. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 14, verse 14, Jesus is referred to, quote, as one like the Son of Man. So it's the same term that was used uh, by Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. And of course, a son is the same species as his father. Jesus is God. Now, Isaiah 44, verse 6 says there is no other God, but it shows that there are two. So I'll read Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Eternal, or Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, behind me there is no God. Now note that the Lord, or the, uh, the King of Israel, and the Redeemer state, I am the first, I am the last, besides me there is no God. Thus, the book of Isaiah clearly shows that there are two who somehow are one. Hence, the Binitarian view is taught in the uh, Old Testament. Now, it's true that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the eternal, our God, the eternal is one. That's true, it says that. Again, the term used for God here is Elohim, which is a plural term. This verse shows us a oneness about this plurality, but that did not exist amongst the pagan deities. Did any Jews understand this? Well, actually, I found something that's, uh, according to uh, Daniel uh, Boyerin uh, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania Press, says, there is significant evidence, uncovered in large part by Seagal, that in the first century, many, perhaps most Jews, held a binitarian doctrine of God. Furthermore, according to some interpretations of Talmud, even rabbinical Jewish writers endorsed a binitarian worship in some of their prayers. Interestingly, there's a verse that uh, some like to point to uh, regarding uh, the plural nature of God. I'd like to read something from Justin, known as Justin Martyr. While we in the Continuing Church of God do not consider that he was a faithful Christian, the Church of Rome, Eastern Orthodox Church, and most Protestants consider that Justin was a saint. So I'd like to read something that Justin Martyr wrote in his uh, uh, dialogue uh, with Trifo. It says, quote, When Scripture says, The Lord rained fire from the Lord out of heaven, the prophetic word indicates that there were two in number, one upon the earth, who it says descended to behold the cry of Sodom, another in heaven, who is also the Lord of the Lord on earth, as he is Father and God, the cause of his power, and of his being Lord and God. Again, when Scripture records the God said in the beginning, Behold, Adam has become like one of us, this phrase, like one of us, also indicates a number. And the words do not admit of a figurative meaning, as the sophists, sort of like the Gnostics, endeavor to fix on them, who are ne neither able to understand nor tell the truth. Now he mentioned the scripture, the Lord raining fire down. This actually comes from the book of Genesis chapter 19. So you've got your Bible. Uh, we'll read Genesis uh, chapter uh, 19, verse 24. Genesis uh, 19, verse 24. It says, Then the, the Lord, or Yahweh, rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord, or Yahweh, out of the heavens. So that's Genesis 19, verse 24. I'd like to read something from a more modern source. This is, uh, this, was, this is on a website that was online. It said, quote, There are two Yahwehs in Genesis 19.24. Now, by the way, this is supposedly 
a Trinitarian, this is a Trinitarian website, by the way, I should mention that, but I find it interesting. They, they think this verse proves Trinitarianism. But again, let me read something else this website wrote. There is no way to escape the clear context that there were two Yahwehs, one on earth that talked to Abraham and commanded Sodom to be destroyed, and a second Yahweh in heaven who actually sent the fire. So you've got from a Trinitarian source saying this verse proves that there were two Yahwehs. Well, therefore, they, it improperly concludes that this was an argument in favor of the Trinity, but actually it's a Benetarian uh, concept is what, what they're promoting. But they don't realize that because most of the time when you see arguments on websites, uh, either for the Trinity or for uh, Unitarianism, they ignore the Binitarian view or the Binitarian perspective. The Trinitarians don't really want to get into Binitarianism because that will really make them look bad. The uh, Unitarians some are more likely to want to deal with Binitarianism, but usually they just deal with Trini Trinitarian arguments. Now, I skipped something I wanted to go over here. Let's go to the book of John. We're going to go now into the New Testament. John chapter 1. In the New Testament, the Apostle John makes the, uh, clear the duality of God. And he makes it clear in the first gospel account, the first writing that we believe the Apostle John wrote that was recorded for Scripture. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, which is Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was nothing made. And the Word, Jesus, is a lot like God the Father. If you go down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, probably I should mention that Unitarians uh, think that's a mistranslation and all that kind of stuff. But it's a fairly literal translation. Uh, and so, again, the Binitarian view is made clear by the Apostle John. But what about Paul? A lot of people like to talk about the Apostle Paul. Well, actually, the Apostle Paul makes the duality of God uh, clear or apparent uh, in the introductions of the books that he wrote. And so I'd like to start off in the book of Romans. We're going to go through uh, what, jo what Paul wrote, uh, starting in the book of Romans, uh, chapter uh, 1 of Romans 1. And we're going to go through his, a lot of his letters. Starts off, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul makes this type of a statement, the last one in verse 7, not about Rome, but the rest of it, uh, repeatedly in his introductions to his letters. Let's go to the next one in your Bible. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read this again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, starting verse 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1.
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God. Oops, I'm sorry, I was reading. Yeah, that's right. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's talking to the church of God in Corinth. And again, he's referring to the Father and the Son. Let's go to the next book. Let's go over to Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men. Skip down to the churches at Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Go again, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God and Father the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. We keep seeing this. So let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 1, let's read that verse. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, you pretty much uh, see the same thing. If you go to 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 2, pretty much see the same thing. 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 2, pretty much the same thing. Uh, let's go to Titus. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. By the way, I did not intentionally skip over Colossians. We'll go back to that one later. Titus 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed to me, according to the commandment of of our of God our Savior. Okay? So he's calling the Savior God. Uh, to Titus, a true son of common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So Benetarian uh, introduction specifically calls the Savior God, and then says Jesus is the Savior. And if Philemon or Philemon Philemon is probably how you pronounce it in the Greek. Uh, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner, Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul did this repeatedly, he referred to the Father and the Son in his introductions, but never the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to Colossians. Let me back up a few books. Colossians uh, uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 1. It says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many who have not seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all rich, riches for the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so we're seeing the Father and Christ mentioned again. Let's go down to verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. And I believe most people who profess Christ have been uh, deceived by philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men in terms of their misunderstanding of the Godhead. According to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ, for in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the term Godhead is a biblical term. And 
Paul is clear the Godhead includes the Father and the Son. He's saying that the Binitarian view is a mystery to many, yet he wrote that the Father and the Son were God. Uh, like Paul, Peter also made the duality of God clear in the introduction to his two books, First Timothy and uh, uh, Second, I mean First Peter and Second Peter. Okay, so Peter made the duality of God clear, but he also left out the Holy Spirit. Peter confirmed that he knew that Jesus Christ was part of the God family when he said to Jesus in Matthew sixteen sixteen, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Peter also seems to confirm the Holy Spirit's not a person in Acts uh, 2, 17 to 18, where he quotes Joel about God pouring out his spirit. While some who have held to a Unitarian position have cited uh, William Bossett's book, which I mentioned before, uh, again, modern scholars have concluded this was uh, not logical. And Bossett considered that Jesus was Lord, but not God. And there was a more recent scholarly work flattening, flat out questioning Bossett's view about the word uh, kyrios. It's a K-Y-R-I-O-S. That's how we would write it out in English. Uh, not meaning God. And, it, and this is from... Uh, Larry Hurtado's Lord Jesus Christ, Devotion to Jesus in, the early, in Early Christianity, in 2003. It is clear that Kyrios was used by Greek-speaking Jews for the Hebrew uh, Tetragrammaton, which is four letters that make up uh, Yahweh, a Y-H, uh, W or V-H. Okay. This is, because what, uh, especially when they're re reading the Hebrew text, let me explain what that means. The Jews were so concerned that they might take God's name in vain, uh, they wouldn't say the four Hebrew letters known as the Tetragrammaton, which is a Y, an H, and there's an argument the next one is a W or a V, and then another H. They wouldn't say that, so instead they refer to God as Lord, so they wouldn't accidentally take God's name in vain. Of course, cursing with the term Lord or anything else, you could take, could take the... Uh, the name in vain, uh, irrespective of how you pronounce it or mispronounce it. So scholars have said, look, the idea that Jesus being Lord didn't mean he was God is ridiculous. So, and uh, Trinitarians would also uh, agree with that. Now, Trinitarians traditionally teach that uh, God is one who shows himself in three modes, or three hypostases, as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They also teach that they're all of the same substance. And, for example, you could say, Jesus said, for example, in John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus taught that. So there's a, Now, in my view, that totally eliminates the Unitarian argument. But Trinitarians say, well, see, it means that they're the same. But he's not the same. Uh, by the way, Matthew, when he uh, quoted Isaiah 7.14, he made, the, made Jesus' Jesus' deity pretty clear. He says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus had to be God, or he wouldn't be called God with us. And of course, in John 20, uh, you can go there if you'd like. I'm going to go to verse 28. Read that. I want to establish the deity of... Uh, Christ a little further in Scripture before I go a little more on some of the Trinitarian and Binitarian arguments. Because I think he's dealing with the Unitarian arguments. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, and Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. If Jesus wasn't God, this would have been a good time to correct him. He didn't. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5, and I'll cut into the middle of it, Philippians 2, verse 5, Paul points out, Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Uh, 
But what about the Father and the Son being exactly the same? People who take a Trinitarian view say that uh, there's one God uh, manifests themselves in three hypostases or three, three persons and that they're the same substance. Well, if they're completely the same, they'd have to be, they would have to be the same. But in Luke 22, once you go over there, I'd like to point out that Jesus did not have the same will as, as the Father. In Luke 22, verse 42, Jesus was praying. And he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is contrasting. There's, there's two wills, his will and the Father's will. Jesus didn't really want to have to get killed and beaten and all that if he wanted. Now, if Jesus was part of what I call the currently defined Trinity, he couldn't have a different will of the Father. But he does have, does have a different will. And you can also look in John 5.30 and John 7, verse 16. And he also could, would be able to speak different words, as it says in John 14.24. And Jesus also said that the Father knew things he did not know. You can look that up in Mark 13, verse 32. And, by the way, in case I go through some of the scriptures too quickly, or I speak too quickly, or both, uh, we, have an, we have a couple of articles at the cogwriter.com website that go through this. And over on YouTube at our Continuing COG channel, uh, if you came there in order to watch this, there will be a link to the article that I'm using for my notes. So all the details are there, so you can take a look at that if you want to learn more. In Mark uh, 10, verse 39, Jesus said he didn't have the authority to determine who would sit at his right hand or his left in the kingdom. So he's not the same as the Father. In my view, the Binitarian explanation is the only one that properly reconciles and teaches these and other scriptures that confound the Trinitarians. One of the issues I have with Unitarians, and I'm not going to go to it here, is that they seem to indicate there are problems with the New Testament. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 34, Scripture can't be broken. So we'll go, I'm not going to go with any more of their, their arguments along that line. Uh, they do, however, argue that they don't believe that Jesus uh, pre-existed. You can go to John 8, verses 56 through 59 for information on that, as well as 2 Corinthians 8, verse uh, 9. And, and 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 10, verse, uh, verses 1 through 6. But what about being one and two being one and all that kind of thing? Well, I read a passage from the Old Testament about that. But let's go to John 17. Because I think this is a concept that a lot of people do not fully grasp. Uh, Unitarians don't understand this at all. Trinitarians understand part of it better, but other parts they don't understand as well. So let's go to John uh, 17, starting verse 20. Read something that Jesus taught. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and that the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. They may be one as we are one. So humans are supposed to, to Christians are to become one with God. And we have the Father and the, and the Son. They're not the same. They're not the same, uh, same the way the Trinitarians teach. And again, they can have different wills, speak different words, and that type of thing. Just like individual Christians, we're not all the same. Now, we were brought into unity of the faith, especially after resurrection, resurrected and, and changed into a spirit being. But we're to be one with God. And that's something else the Unitarians and the Trinitarians have major difficulty uh, understanding. Now, we have an article at the Cogwriter.com website on deification, and we also have an article on what is your destiny, as well as a sermon at the Continuing COG channel about your destiny and how, um, what, the de what the destiny for Christians is. 
Okay. All right, so this is what I was looking for. Uh, let's read some words from Jesus in Matthew uh, 19. So go back a few chapters. Again, this, this uh, is to somewhat counter some of the Unitarian arguments, because some with Church of God backers have had some kind of Unitarian involvement. Uh, Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. It says, And he, that's Jesus, answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. That's why I read uh, Genesis 2.24 before. Jesus referred to it later. Genesis 2.24 shows, according to Jesus, how two beings can be one. Now, if you're married, or you've been married, or if you haven't been married, you've, you've had parents, hopefully you knew them, you'll know that your father and your mother were not the same. They're two different people. Similarly in the Godhead, uh, currently it's composed of two, two different uh, beings. But Jesus said that the husband and wife were one. So the idea that two can be one is clearly mentioned in, in the New, New Testament. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read something the Apostle Paul wrote. Ephesians 5, starting verse 30. Paul writes, For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and his bones. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul is showing that uh, there are two that are one flesh, and that the marital relationship pictures Christ being one with his church. There's a oneness and a two-ness that people do not understand. There's a oneness and a two-ness in his relationship with the Father, and there's a oneness between him and the church which composes many, many members. In Romans 12, you don't have to go there, 4 through 6, Paul made this clear. He said, we have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. So some have tried to say that there are not multiple beings in the Godhead, but that's simply uh, not the case. Now, what have some scholars said about this? Other, one scholar who I mentioned before, I'd like to read from him again. This is from uh, Larry Hurtado, an abstract called The Binitarian Shape of Early Christian Worship. He wrote, Early Christian worship specifies two figures, God and Jesus, as recipients. And there's something else he wrote in his book called Lord Jesus Christ. There are a fairly consistent linkage and subordination of Jesus to God as the Father in these circles, evident even in the Christian text in the latter decades of the first century that are commonly regarded as a very high Christology, such as the Gospel of John and Revelation. He says, this is why I refer to this Jesus devotion as a binitarian form of monotheism. There are two distinguishable figures, God and Jesus, but they are posited in a relationship to each other that seems intended to avoid the diatheism of two gods and the devotional practices that show a similar concern. In my judgment, this is Larry Hurtado, this Jesus devotion amounts to treatment of him as a recipient of worship at a surprisingly early point in the first century, and certainly a pragmatic inclusion of a second figure unparalleled in monotheistic tradition of the time. What does this all mean? What he's trying to say is that early Christians, definitely from the first century and in the second century, worship Jesus as worship Jesus. So that would only be something we do of God. Now, some of you say, "Well, I've never heard of Larry Tratado, and you might be a Trinitarian. And, you know, who is he? And he, his, how can we trust his work?" Actually, at least one University of Notre Dame scholar calls says the following: "A fantastic work. Larry Tratado has written." 
what, many, what may well prove to be one of the most important works on Jesus in this generation. So a Trinitarian university says this is most, might be one of the most important works of, about Jesus in this generation. And he's talking about the Binitarianism, which is what that book talks about. There definitely was a Binitarian view. Now, Professor Hurtado, Larry Hurtado, concluded that the Trinitarian view came later. And that's, that's correct. He, al he also wrote, The Binitarian pattern of devotion in which both God the Father and Jesus are objects of such reverence goes back to the earliest observable stages in the movement that became Christianity. The central place given to Jesus and their concern to avoid diatheism by reverencing Jesus rather consistently the reverence, with references to the Father combined to shape the proto-Orthodox uh, Binitarian pattern of devotion Jesus truly is reverenced as divine. Now, what he's talking about when he keeps talking about diatheism is we in the continuing church of God do not teach that there are two God beings that are opposed to each other, but we do teach that the Father is uh, in higher authority than the Son, or the Son is subordinate to the Father, which is not what the, what the Trinity teaches. The Trinity teaches that there are three co-equal uh, members. The Bible doesn't teach that. Early Christians tried to make that clear, and they also tried to make it clear they were, weren't diatheists in the uh, polytheism sense of the word. Well, Larry Hurtado also notes that there are numerous places where Ignatius refers to Jesus as God, theos in Greek, yet Ignatius refers to Jesus as theos while still portraying him as subordinate to the Father. And that's exactly what we teach in the continuing church of God. That is a binitarian view. I'd like to read from uh, another scholar. The argument that Christianity is not binitarian but trinitarian, hence could not be perceived as a two-power heresy, it ignores the fact that it's not so much what Christianity thought of itself that counts, but how it appeared to its rabbinic critics. And there we see clearly it was often described as binitarian or dualistic rather than trinitarian. So in other words, the scholar is saying, we, while we argue about Trinity, whatever, or Binitarianism, the, the Jews who did not accept Christ considered the Christian religion to be dualistic or Binitarian. And uh, uh, that, that's correct. Another scholar named James McGrath noted, when Paul engages in a great deal of legitimization of his use of the Torah, there's no indication he feels that he needs to defend himself against the two powers heresy. You know, the, the Father and the Son. Paul's view of the exalted Christ investiture with the divine name must be viewed in relation to non-Christian Jewish texts such as the Apocalypse of Abraham. The work refers to an exalted angel, Yahweh, who, who bears the divine name. There's simply no evidence that a belief in the supreme mediator agent of God, one that might later recall the second power, was controversial during the second century, first century CE. This is not explained by any universal authority who could speak for the Jews Orthodox this period. Basically, without going through all of this, uh, some believe that there was a type of Binitarianism that uh, the Jews knew and understood. That wasn't why it wasn't such a big deal. Others say the rabbis still brought this up. Either way, the argument was not on Trinitarianism, but Binitarianism. Now, I took a course on uh, church history from uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, and they had me buy several books, and one of them was a book on the Trinity. It was written by William Rush, and it was supposed to be a Trinitarian book, and supposed to make you believe in the Trinity. But I'd like to read a statement from this, this book. Quote, the Binitarian formulas are found in Romans 8.11, 2 Corinthians 4.14, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.20, 1, 1 Timothy 1.2, 1, 1 Peter 1.21, 2 John 1.13. No doctrine of Trinity in the Nicene sense is present in the New Testament. Okay, this is again from a Trinitarian scholar, a book used in a master's program by uh, Fuller Theological Seminary which is a Trinitarian school. No doctrine of the Trinity in a Nicene sense is present in the New Testament. 
Furthermore, there is no doctrine of the Trinity in the strict sense in the Apostolic Fathers. Apostolic Fathers? Apostolic Fathers are writings for people who the, the Greco-Romans consider to be uh, early Christian writers. Now, we in the Continuing Church of God don't consider all the Apostolic Fathers to be faithful Christians. But what, what uh, uh, William Roche is saying is, look, even in those writings, you're not going to find the Trinity. And that's important because the so-called anti, uh, excuse me, uh, the so-called anti-Nicene fathers or the apostolic fathers specifically supposedly bridged the gap between the New Testament and what ended up being the Greco-Roman face. But what happened was, even at that stage, most though there, the, those writings were not Trinitarian. Now there were some heresies by the apostolic fathers who were not in the Church of God. I'm not saying there weren't. But as far as the general idea, they were not teaching. They were not teaching the Trinity. Now, one of these documents of the so-called Apostolic Fathers has been called the uh, Second Letter of Clement, but that's not really uh, a good title for it because there's no evidence that Clement had anything to do with it. Actually, a scholar by the name of uh, M. W. Holmes, in his book called the Apostolic Fathers: Greek Texts and English Translations calls it, quote, the oldest complete Christian sermon that survived. So in the so-called Apostolic Fathers, there's a writing called the oldest Christian sermon that survived. And there are other ones that perhaps are older, but this is one that they say. It was perhaps given within a year or so of the Apostle uh, John's death. But let me read what it says in, the, in, different, in different parts of it. It says, Brothers, we ought... So to think of Jesus Christ as God and a judge of the living and the dead. So the oldest known sermon, it may be a Christian sermon, flat out says that Jesus Christ was God. And it also says in verse uh, chapter 14, verse 1, So then, brothers, if we do the will of God our Father. So we see Jesus called God. We see the Father called God. And I won't go through all, but there's more quotes Along, along those lines. Now one of the uh, so-called apostolic fathers, one that we in the Continuing Church of God would consider was a true Christian leader, was uh, uh, Polycarp of Smyrna. And Polycarp of Smyrna, Polycarp of Smyrna was probably the first physical head of the Smyrna church era during that time frame, whereas the ancient sermon was be from the Ephesus period. Anyway, I'd like to read what he wrote in his uh, epistle to the Philippians. This is from Polycarp. Now may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and in all gentleness, in all, all avoidance of wrath and forbearance, in the long suffering, in patient endurance, and in purity, that he may grant you a portion of the lot amongst its saints, and to us with you, and to you who are under heaven, who shall believe on our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and on his Father. So Polycarp wrote that the Father was God and the Son was God. Now there's Ignatius, who I alluded to before because uh, Larry Hurtado had referred to him. Ignatius uh, knew Polycarp, and Polycarp knew him. And in his letter to the Ephesians, he wrote, uh, 18, verse 2, For our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary in accordance with God's plan of the seed of David. It is true, but also the Holy Spirit. He was born and baptized so that by his submission he might purify the water. And... His, his, actually, at the introduction to his letter of the Ephesians, he says, The fullness of God the Father and of Jesus Christ our God. God appeared in human form to bring newness to eternal life. So Ignatius referred to the Father as God, the Son as God. That's a Benetarian view. And he also wrote... Uh, he's also... Ignatius is also known as the Theophorus. Now this is his letter to the Smyrnians. Ignatius, who is also Theophorus, to the Church of God 
the Father, and of Jesus Christ, the Beloved, which has mercifully endowed with every grace, being filled with faith and love, and lacking in no grace, most reverent and bearing the holy treasure, to the church which is in Smyrna in Asia, in a blameless spirit and in the word of God, abundant greetings, I give glory to Jesus Christ, the God who bestowed such wisdom upon you. So we refer to the Father and the Son as God. That's a Benetarian view. Um, let's skip over. There's somebody after the Apostolic Fathers, somebody by the name of Melito of Sardis, who was also a Church of God a leader. And he wrote in something called a Discourse, which was in the presence of Antonius Caesar. No eye can see him, nor thought apprehend him, nor language describe him. Those who love him speak of him thus. Father and God of truth. And then he wrote in something called the, uh, On the Nature of Christ. For the deeds done by Christ after his baptism, especially his miracles, have gave indication assurance to the world of the deity hidden in his flesh. For being at once both God and perfect man likewise, he concealed the signs of his deity though he was a true God existing before all the ages. So what he's saying is that uh, Jesus was God. He considered Jesus to be God. He did not, by the way, consider the Holy Spirit to be God. Uh, he called the Holy Spirit the finger of the Lord. Uh, then there's another person I'd like to mention uh, briefly. This is... Uh, uh, Irenaeus. Irenaeus is a, uh, considered a saint by the Greco-Romans. He says, There's none other called God by the Scriptures except the Father of all and the Son and those who possess the adoption. Notice, Irenaeus said, the Bible says there's only three types of God, three called God. So I thought you were talking about Vinitarian view. I am the Father, the Son, not the Holy Spirit, but the Christians who become deified later is what he's referring to. Okay, so that's also a uh, a binitarian a binitarian view. And I mentioned before, Justin Martyr said that there were two in number in terms of talking about uh, the deity. And. Interestingly, Tertullian, who's known as the father of Latin theology, around 213 A.D., and even though he was so, somewhat of a Trinitarian, he wrote, this is in his letter against Praxis 13, verse 1, Well then, you reply, if he was God who spoke, and he was also God who created, at this rate, one God spoke and another created. Thus, two gods are declared. That's true. Uh, there are others uh, that I'm not going to read from here uh, who also, in terms of church history, supported the idea of a Benetarian, a Benetarian view. I'd like to go into one other thing that some people may find interesting. In addition to the writings, uh, Larry Hurtado mentions something about something that I'd like to read here. Uh, it's not just the regular writings. But there was something on the writings that were supposed to identify the writings. And there, there was something called a sacra nomina, or the sacred name, if you will. These were generally two-letter abbreviations that were put on the outside of documents, probably to identify them as Christian. And Larry Hurtado writes, The Christian nomina sacra differ in form from any Jewish scribal devices. Most significantly, the four earliest Christian nomina sacra are the two key words for God, Theos and Kyrios, uh, and the key designations for Jesus, Jesus, Christos, Kyrios. I think I might have said that Kyrios before, but it's, it's Kyrios. If therefore, as is usually believed, the nomina sacra practice represents an expression of piety and reverence, it's a striking departure from, cre from, excuse me, from pre Christian Jewish scribal practice to extend to these designations of Jesus the same scribal treatment given to the designations of God. That is, the four earliest Christian nomina 
sacra collectively manifest one noteworthy expression of what I've called the binitarian shape of earliest Christian piety and devotion. Well, later, during uh, Constantine's time, uh, the, the Pergamus, well, after Protestant times, the Pergamus era became uh, predominant. And there were people such as the Albigenses and uh, Bogomils, and according to the Nation Master Encyclopedia, they denied the Trinity. Uh, Binitarianism ex existed from early times. There's all kinds of proof about that. Now, those of us in the Church of God have practices that have been called Nazarene practices. Uh, what do you mean Nazarene practices? Well, we know that Paul was considered a ringleader of the sect called the Nazarenes. But in the 4th uh, uh, and 5th centuries, uh, probably 2nd and 3rd, at least parts of it, there were people who were called Nazarenes. They believed in the Father, they believed in the Son, they went to church on Saturday, they kept the holy days, they avoided unclean meats, and that kind of thing. And Larry Hurtado writes that Nazarene Christianity had a view of Jesus fully compatible with the beliefs favored by the Proto-Orthodox. Indeed, they could be considered part of the circles that made up the Proto-Orthodox Christianity this time. According to scholar Prince, said the Nazarene Christianity was the dominant form of Christianity in the first and second centuries. In other words, those who kept the Sabbath and the Holy Days were the, were the predominant forms of people who called themselves Christian in the first and second centuries. And that appears to be true. It says, the devotional stance toward Jesus that characterized most of the Jewish Christians in the first and second centuries seems to be congruent with the proto-Orthodox devotion to Jesus. The proto-Orthodox binitarian pattern of devotion. So, first century, second century, whatever, the Nazarene Christians, early Christians, were uh, binitarian. Now, toward the end of the time of the Sardis era, there was, a, excuse me, the Smyrna era, I said Sardis, I meant Smyrna, uh, something came up. There is a, a, a Dr. Arius, the word doctor means teacher, and he caused some issues. I'm going to read something what Catholic Encyclopedia records. Says, Arius described the Son as a second or inferior God, standing midway between the first cause and all creatures. He said, God alone was without beginning, unoriginate, but the Son was originated, he had not existed. So that was Kind of, kind of the view. Now there was a council of Nicaea that Emperor Constantine called together. A lot of people misunderstand what happened in this council. Some believe most of the people there uh, didn't accept that Jesus was, was God. And that's why they had to have this council. Uh, that's not the case. Some think that most people who attended there were Trinitarian. And therefore, they just needed to deal with a, a few people who were uh, uh, Unitarians. That also wasn't the case. According to uh, a professor over at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, he said that at, at this conference, the, uh, there were about 10% of the people there were supporters of uh, Dr. Arias. So about 10% were Arians or Unitarians. And only about 15% were Trinitarians. That leaves 75%. Who are these people? Well, he calls them in-between. So those who held a position between the Arians and Trinitarians, 75% of the attendees, and that Eusebius, the church historian, was the main spokesman for, for them. Well, what happened was, they wanted to deal with the Arian heresy that Dr. Arius had brought up. And there were various arguments. But what happened during this is a guy by the name of Athanasius stood up and he made an impassioned speech. He was a fairly young man at the time. And when he gave this speech, the pagan emperor Constantine, who had called this conference and summoned everybody there, he was dressed basically as a gold angel. He stood up and people saw, wow, he's endorsing this. So what they did is they came up with a definition of the Godhead in Nicaea that the Arians would not support. But it was one that was supported by the semi-Arians or the Binitarians, as well as the Trinitarians. 
Some have claimed that the so-called Nicene Creed came out of this particular conference, council. That's not the case. It didn't come out until one, uh, in 381 AD. After this council, what they did basically was they declared Jesus was God somehow, that he uh, always existed. And again, that's consistent with what we in the Continuing Church of God teach. We have no argument with that particular part. Even though Emperor Constantine, who had a Trinitarian background, because in the Mithra religion, which is a religion that Constantine followed, there was kind of a trinity. He liked that. The reality is most of the people who came there were Binitarian at the time. Now, one Roman Catholic wrote something kind of interesting about uh, Athanasius, and I want to mention this. This is, uh, I just got this, this is a, the fall 2014, it's called the Phantom of Crusader. And I'm going to read something written by the guy who puts this out, which is this particular priest here, Nicholas Gruner. Here's what he wrote. He says, remember the example of St. Athanasius, the great champion of the true faith in the 4th century crisis concerning the person and nature of Christ. Listen to what he says. St. Athanasius stood up against 90% of all the bishops in the church and even endured the appearance of being excommunicated by Pope Liberius, so confident was he in the truth about his position. This Catholic writer is saying that 90% of the people who were at Nicaea were not Trinitarian. Well, I think it was more like uh, uh, 85%, but okay. <laughs> uh, People have been misled to believe that the Trinitarian view that most who profess Christ cling to or hold to was the, was the one original view of the Christian church, which was not true. Second was the view of the apostles of the New Testament, which was not true. Third was the view of the people who came right after the death of the apostles, the so-called apostolic fathers. That also was not true. The early Christian church held a semi-Aryan, otherwise known as a Binitarian uh, view of, of the Godhead. And many don't grasp that today. Instead, they're told something else. They're basically told, Dr. Arius came up, brought up this, this heresy. It had to be dealt with. The great Emperor Constantine dealt with this, dealt with the Arian heresy. But, for some reason, part of it spread. <laughs> And the reality was that most of the people held a Benetarian viewpoint. Now, the Greco-Roman historians usually use the term semi-Aryan as opposed to Benetarian. And let me make this clear. The term Unitarian, uh, Aryan, semi-Aryan, Benetarian, Trinitarian, how did that develop? Well, it actually had to do with uh, Dr. Arius. People who had his view were called Arians, and those who uh, didn't think Jesus was, ever became divine became known as Unitarians. Uh, Arians, Dr. Arius basically considered that Jesus, some, at some point in time, became divine. So he wasn't, he, but he was more, more like the Unitarians. Then there's the semi-Arians. These are people who didn't agree with him, otherwise known as the Binitarians who believed that the Father was God and the Son was God and the Holy Spirit was the power of God. Those were the bulk of actual Christians on the planet as well as professing Christians on the planet at the time. What time we're talking about? We're talking about till at least uh, the middle of the 4th century. So centuries after Jesus died and was resurrected, was killed and was resurrected, most people uh, held a semi-Aryan view of the Godhead. Uh, a leading Catholic historian at the time, Eusebius, he was a semi-Aryan, and he was succeeded by another semi-Aryan. Uh, a Catholic scholar and priest by the name of Bellarimo Bugatti wrote, when in 338 Eusebius died in Caesarea, he was succeeded by his disciple Acacius, who shared the, se the semi-Aryanism of his master. There was even a semi-Aryan council in Seleucia in 359, attended by Greco-Roman church leaders. Uh, in 335, and again, I'm reading all these from uh, the scholar Bugatti, Catholic priest, the semi-Aryan bishops returning from the Council of Tyre, 
They consecrated a, a basilica. In other words, many of the Greco-Roman bishops at that time were still semi-Arian. This is after the Council of Nicaea. Catholic Encyclopedia says, the second formula of Sirmium, this is a council in 357, stated that the doctrine of the extreme, extreme Arians, they were against this. It's against this, the semi-Arian bishops assembled in Ankara, Anxria, sorry, uh, the Episcopal city of their leader, Basilis, and issued a counter formula asserting that the Son is in all things like the Father. And now uh, this is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. That was too. This it says the Numenaki, the Numatomaki, Numatomaki. Sorry, I should have practiced that out loud. I've been writing it so many years, I never really say it out loud. The majority of this sect were clearly orthodox on the uh, consubstantiality of the Son. And they, they sent a deputation from the semi-Aryan Council of Lampsicus in 364 to Pope Liberius, who after some hesitation acknowledged the soundness of their faith. In the Council of Rimini in 359 AD, Nearly all bishops present, which were 400, agreed to sign a semi-Aryan creed. Well, that's more than showed up at the uh, Council of Nicaea. The, uh, the reality is that most bishops in the Greco-Roman faith were not Trinitarian in the uh, mid to late 4th uh, century. I say mid to late 4th century because later in the 4th century they got forced into it. Well, the same, uh, there was a, another council. The Council of Romini was also called the Council of Arinuma. So I'd like to read something that the historian Sozeman wrote about it. it. says there were several bishops of Bithynia. This would be like around Constantinople. Among whom were Maris, Bishop of Chalcedon, Uphilus, the Bishop of the Goths. These prelates, having assembled together, number about 50, they confirmed the formulary read at the Council of Arinium, adding its provision that the term substance and hypostasia should, should never again be used with reference to God. The term hypostasia should never again be used to reference to God. Well, that's how Trinitarians define it, even though early leaders that they tend to trace their history through were opposed to it. Socrates of Scholasticus, around the same time, he reported the following from that council. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus, in Christ, our Lord and God. So they said the Father was God, the Son was God. But since the term ovia, of substance or essence, which was used by the Father's very simple and intelligible sense, being not understood by the people, has been a cause of offense, we have thought proper to reject it, as it's not contained even in the sacred writings, and that no mention should be made of it in the future. Inasmuch as the Holy Scriptures have nowhere mentioned the substance of the Father and of the Son, nor ought the, quote, substance, end quote, of the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit even be named. But we affirm that the Son is like the Father in such matter as sacred scriptures declare and teach. And the same council said this about the Holy Spirit. We also believe in the Holy Spirit. And we in the continuing church of God believe in the Holy Spirit. Notice, they believe in the Holy Spirit as the Comforter, according to how it's written, the Spirit of Truth. So, Binitarians or Semi-Arians believe in the Holy Spirit, but not as a third member of some kind of a trinity. There, is a, there are other important Semi-Arian bishops, or Binitarian bishops, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia. For example, St. Cyril... Jerusalem, Bishop of Jerusalem, Doctor of the Church, born 315, died 386. He appeared at the Second Council of Seleucia in 359, in which the semi-Aryan party was triumphant. He belonged to the semi-Aryan party and is content to declare the Son is in all things like the Father. Well, some have questioned whether or not uh, Cyril was semi-Aryan. It's also known that Maximus II, who preceded him as Bishop of Jerusalem, had a semi-Aryan view. Catholic St. Jerome, while discussing the Arian and anti-Arian writings, noted, for 
Tunasius, an African by birth, bishop of Aquila, Aquilia, during the reign of Constances, composed brief commentaries in the Gospels by chapters written in rustic style and is held in detestation because when Liberius, bishop of Rome, was driven to exile for the faith, he was induced by the urgency of Fortunatius to subscribe to the heresy. What? I know that sounds a little strange. Jerome is saying that the Bishop of Rome got pressured by this uh, Fortunatius, Atinus, to agree to a Benetarian view of the Godhead. It says, when Constance died in 350 and his semi-Aryan brother was left supreme, the persecution of Athanasius was redoubled into violence. Athanasius had been persecuted sometimes. It was concerning the last council in 359 that St. Jerome wrote, the whole world groaned and marveled to find itself Aryan. Well, but listen to this part. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. For the Latin bishops were driven by threats and chicanery to sign concessions which at no time represented their genuine views. So what the Church of Rome was trying to spin this, and yes, I'm calling this spin, is that when these bishops in 359 agreed with the semi-Aryan formula, that they did it dishonestly. He said they were lying to pretend to be semi-Aryan. So apparently the Catholic Church is teaching, and he did this about Liberius too in a degree, that it was better to be a Trinitarian liar than to be telling the truth when you were semi-Aryan. <laughs> uh, I can't reconcile that with scriptures, but that's actually what they, what they teach. Well, what about the Eastern Orthodox? Well, I mentioned uh, Cyril, but let's read another one. This is from uh, the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia again. Toward the middle of the 4th century, Macedonius, Bishop of Constantinople, and after him a number of semi-Arians, while apparently accepting the divinity of the Word, so they were Benetarian, denied that of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. Uh, there's another book by James Crystal called Authoritative Christianity, the First Ecumenical Council, says Macedonius denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost and was made Bishop of Constantinople. So you did not have to be a Trinitarian at the time to do those kind of things. And here's another thing about him. He's a Bishop of Constantinople in the middle of the 4th century. He denied the Holy Ghost was equal in essence and dignity to God the Father. But what about the Trinity? Where did this come from? I'd like to read something from an Orthodox Catholic and uh, uh, a bishop named um, Marcellus of Ankira, as Ansira. It's A N C Y R A. He's, he's apparently one who put together what's known as the oldest so-called Apostles' Creed, which is called the Old Roman form. Here's what he wrote about the nature of God around the middle of the 4th century. Now, with the heresy of the Areomaniacs, which has corrupted the Church of, Church of God, so he saw, calls this the heresy of the Areomaniacs has corrupted the Church of God. So in other words, you had Arius, but because of that, you get this other corruption. So these teach... Three hypostasis, remember something they were never supposed to do, just as Valentinus, the, the heretic, first invented in the book entitled by him on the three natures. For he, that's Valentinus, was the first to invent three hypostasis in the three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's discovered to have filched this from Hermes and Plato. So, the, so we've got the reality that there was a heretic by the name of Valentinus. And by the way, Valentinus was denounced by Polycarp. And Valentinus is considered to be a heretic by the Church of Rome, the Eastern Orthodox, Protestant scholars, and those of us in the Church of in the Continuing Church of God. We all say he's a heretic. But he's the one, according to a Eastern Orthodox Catholic bishop, who came up with this idea of, of uh, the, basically the Trinitarian concept. In the middle of the 4th century, we see leaders who held to 
a Benetarian view of the Godhead. Actually, in all the so-called five apostolic sees, see if I can remember them all, uh, Rome, where you had a Pope Liberius sign off on a semi-Arian formula, Constantinople, where I read about Macedonius, who was clearly there, Cyril in Jerusalem, there's four. Uh, there's also information about uh, uh, Antioch, as well as Alexandria, that in those regions, at least one of the leading bishops during the 4th century held to a semi-Aryan view of the Godhead. So if you come from a Roman Catholic background or an Eastern Orthodox background, and you think that your church has always been Trinitarian, all your leaders have been Trinitarian from the beginning, that simply not the case. You don't find any early writings from any bishops of Rome, for example, uh, endorsing the Trinity. Uh, now, some, something seems to have started to develop there the late 2nd, early 3rd century. But the, even then, they, were, they still had changes to make. And again, most people who professed Christ uh, in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd centuries uh, held a binitarian view of the Godhead. Now, that all changed. How did that change? Well, there was another emperor by the name of uh, uh, Theodosius, and he called the Council of Constantinople. And this council was called in 381. And basically what happened here is they decided that you had to believe the Trinity if you were supposed to be a Greco-Roman Catholic uh, person. So if these bishops wanted to keep their power, their authority, their position in the empire, and for those who are unfamiliar with it, the Eastern Orthodox consider that they are Catholic, um, and the Roman Catholics will admit that the Eastern Orthodox are Catholic according to their definition. In order to be, used that, be called that, you had to continue to have this particular new view, the Trinitarian view, which was forced upon them uh, by the Council of Constantinople. It was finally, finally adopted then. Now, about the uh, semi-Arians, am I just making this up that they were the, or the Binitarians, that they were the primary people uh, in, let's say, the Eastern Orthodox areas in the fourth century? No. We read this from the Catholic Encyclopedia, if you didn't like the other references or if they weren't strong enough for you. Semi-Arians, quote, a name frequently given to the conservative majority in the East in the 4th century. The conservative majority. Not some odd group, the con so, according to them, the conservative majority. In other words, people who kept with the original faith, or a version of the original belief, at least, in terms of the Godhead, in the 4th century. They were not... They were not... Uh, uh, they weren't Trinitarians, but it, it, it all changed. Now, there were semi-Arians in Armenia, or Benetarians in the 4th century, who kept the Sabbath. For example, let me read you this. This is from uh, General History of the Sabbatarian uh, Churches from uh, Tamar Davis. Estetheus was succeeded by Arias, a semi-Arian. He urged a pure morality and a stricter observance of the Sabbath day. I'd like to read something from Epiphanius in the late 4th century when he wrote about the Semi-Arians, or the Benetarians. Here's what he said about the Benetarians. Now, I will comment, if you go too into this in great depth, you're going to find sometimes there are different definitions of Semi-Arians, and some of them are incorrect and not compatible with what we in the Continuing Church of God believe. They're correct in the sense that the term semi-Aryan covered a lot of things. But basically, the, the Binitarian position or the semi-Aryan position is the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is the power of God. Anyway, here's what Epiphanius wrote. Semi-Aryans hold the truly orthodox view of the Son that he was forever with the Father. But all these blaspheme the Holy Spirit and don't count him the Godhead with the Father and the Son. Well, it's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, the Bible, never teaches that particular thing. Uh, and Epiphanius condemned them as being monstrous, half-formed people of two natures. Uh, another in the 4th century, uh, Gre uh, Gregory of uh, uh, Nyssa, describes the beliefs of the non-Trinitarians as follows. 
He says, but they reveal more clearly the aim of their argument. As regards the Father, they admit that He is in God, and the Son likewise is honored with the attribute of Godhead. But the Spirit, who is reckoned with the Father and the Son, they cannot include in their conception of the Godhead, but hold that the power of the Godhead, issuing from the Father to the Son, and their halting, separates the nature of the Spirit from divine glory. Around uh, 600 A.D., there were some true non-Trinitarian Christians who were known as Paletians by their opponents. They believed that Christ came down from heaven and they held uh, a basically a Trinitarian view. I mention that because this would put them into the Pergamus era of the church. I mentioned some writings from the New Testament and Ignatius, which would be tied to the uh, Ephesus era of the church. Writings from uh, Melito and Polycarp, which would be tied into the Smyrna era of the church, and then into the Pergamus era of the church, we see that throughout the Church of God, history has been that a semi-Arian or Binitarian view of the Godhead was held. I mention this because, again, some have suggested that Binitarianism is a, is a new idea, but scholars know that's not the case. Scholars who are willing to admit the truth, that is. You know, Catholic scholars admit that there were Binitarians and semi or semi-Arians throughout history. Uh, especially uh, up until the 4th century, the idea that we are odd or some weird cult in the continuing Church of God because we don't accept the decision of the Greco-Roman Council called together by uh, a non-Christian, in our view, uh, emperor by the name of Theodosius doesn't make us a cult. It makes us being faithful to God rather than men. The, uh, this, is, this is a heresy, supposedly, uh, in the town of Albi in southern France. This error taught that there were uh, two gods. The Albigenses taught that Jesus was God, but he appeared only as man while on the earth. And that's actually uh, consistent with what we in the Church of God teach. We teach that Jesus entered himself as his divinity when he was here. He had some divine prerequisites, as Melito indicated. But I will also comment, when you look through church history, uh, a lot of times, uh, names that are applied to different groups, you have to you have to look at the groups in more detail. For example, being raised uh, uh, Roman Catholic, I was taught that there were two types of Christians: Catholics and Protestants, and the Catholics included the Eastern Orthodox. Well, we in the Church of God, continuing Church of God, we're not Protestant, but we'd be thrown in with them. Well, anyway, same thing. The Albigenses. Most people who the Catholics and the Greco-Romans called Albigenses were not in the Church of God, but some some were. Now, that those those uh, also happened during the Thyatiran era of the Church that we saw people who had this particular uh, view view of the Godhead. Now, in the uh, Sardis era of the Church, I should comment that. Uh, read something that Richard Nichols wrote about uh, something from the Milliard Church in 1670. So this is back to the Milliard Church back in 1670. Quote, Joseph Davis Sr., a member of the London Milliard Church, wrote in 1670 that he believed in one God, the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the power, not part of the Trinity. And I mention this now. Why do I mention this now? Because you've got groups like the Seventh-day Baptists uh, who sometimes have tried to claim these people. The Seventh-day Baptists do not realize that people they claim were Sabbath keepers, such as when I quoted uh, Damar, uh, Tamar Davis uh, talking about Arius before. They were semi-Aryan and they kept the Sabbath. Whereas you've got the, uh, the current uh, uh, Seventh-day Baptists, uh, they, they, they've dropped that and they've become Trinitarian. I'm not going to go into all these papers I have in front of me now, but the original Adventists were anti-Trinitarian. Now, I will comment that some don't believe that Ellen White was a Trinitarian. Some think that some of her writings were tampered with, but ignoring that, most people who claim to be uh, Seventh-day Adventists are Trinitarian. And if you want more specific information uh, on that, you can go ahead and uh, read the paper I mentioned, which is at the cogwriter.com website. 
on uh, the Vinitarian two, two beings from before the beginning. His name is Article. Well, what about the Church of God's seventh day for the end of the Sardis era? I'd like to say what uh, they wrote or they declared in August 1924. They said, quote, The Church of God recognizes two divine beings being called God, the Father and Jesus Christ, His Son. Now, there were sometimes some Unitarians who were associated with the Church of God, or semi-Unitarians. Uh, this, is, this is true, but as far as the Church of God, the position of the Church of God throughout history has been that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Son is of lower authority uh, than, than, than the Father. Okay. Now what I'd like to do here is read the official statement, or from the Statement of Beliefs of the Continuing Church of God, so you know what we, we teach. And you can find our Statement of Beliefs at the ccog.org website. ccog dot org website, ccog.org. I'll get it right. It says, a Binitarian or semi-Arian view that acknowledges that the Holy Spirit was held by the apostolic and post-apostolic true Christian leaders. The Father was considered to be God by all early professing Christians. Holy Spirit was not referred to as God or person by any of the early true Christians. Jesus was considered to be God by the true Christians in a section called the Godhead. The Father and Son comprised the Godhead and work through, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Scripture shows that God is one eternal divine being consisting of two, the Father and the Word, at this time. Genesis 1.26, Ephesians 2.19, 3.14 to 15, John 1.14. With faithful children to be added, Hebrews 2.10 through 11, John, 1 John 3.1 through 2, Ephesians 3.14-15. To become, as Jesus Christ, Romans 8.29, who is God. I won't read all the scriptures there. You can go to our statement if you want to read it yourself. Holy Spirit is not a separate being in the theological sense and is given to those who, after they've properly repented, been baptized. The early original Christians had what has been called a binitarian view of the Godhead. And this is consistent throughout uh, history. I showed you from the different church eras. Uh, after the Philadelphia era, it was the uh, Laodicean era. And most of the Laodiceans also hold to a, a, a binitarian view the Godhead, although they don't uh, tend to use that particular expression. There's a lot more that I could go over on, on the nature of God, and I probably will in other sermons. But what I'd hope with what I went through uh, so far is to give you a couple of ideas. First of all, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as God. In the Old Testament, the plurality of God was known. In the Old Testament, we saw two beings, one like the Son of God in the Ancient of Days. There's also other scriptures that people think are pointing to the duality of, of God in the Old Testament. And throughout the New Testament, the Apostle Paul had a binitarian greeting, if you will, uh, related to the Godhead, but did not do such a thing in terms of uh, the Holy Spirit. Early professors of Christ taught that Jesus was God. They taught the Father was God. Except for some heretics such as Valentinus, they did not teach the Holy Spirit was God. This is a Benetarian view. Up until the 4th century, or even during the 4th century, many Greco-Roman bishops still held to a semi-Arian view of the Godhead until, because of persecutions, imperial pressures, etc., a Trinitarian formula was agreed to in a council of Constantinople in 381 AD. But those in the true Church of God didn't deviate. We kept that particular position throughout history, and that's what we in the continuing Church of God teach today. We, I hope by sharing you with you the truth of the Binitarian view of scriptures uh, and history, you better grasp that those who call us names because we held to the original faith that was once for all delivered to the saints are in error. They shouldn't call us names for believing the Bible if they actually claim to believe it themselves. We need to believe the Bible above traditions and counsels of men, irrespective of how people try to pressure us for their own views. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is the power of God. That's the Binitarian view. It's throughout the Old Testament, it's throughout the New Testament, and church history 
shows that this was a documented view throughout history. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.